Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 9 of my beta campaign. Ahead for us today, we have a couple more jet flight uh, curb and atmospheric missions to perform. We have two more unmanned uh, probe missions to perform. But uh, we're going to start off with uh, Stock 3 here. Now, you might be noticing off to the right, uh, bottom right corner, that there is no Kerbal in Curse Dock 3 despite having a crew capsule at the top. That's because this particular one has one of those octo probes in it. It is flying on its own and the reason why it's doing that is because we have a Kerbal lost in space again. This is end fraud this time that we're up to rescue and uh, so I took one of the Curse Docks, modified it a little bit so that uh, we don't have to have somebody fly up there to go get them. We can have this autonomous craft go up there and get them. And we'll cut straight to finishing off our circularization burn. Um, you've seen me do a rendezvous before. You've seen me do these rescue missions before. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. But there are a couple of things that are a little different this time. One of the biggest ones being that I now have the ability to make a maneuver node. So um, this is actually going to be quite a bit easier with the maneuver node. So I take a guesstimate at where I think the maneuver node is going to be. And then I, uh, you know, burn, uh, set... A little bit of prograde and you start to get those intercept markers over there on the opposite side of the planet and the idea of course is to tweak the timing of the burn and the amount of prograde of the burn uh, to get those markers to be as close as they can be now I like to just get just the single markers to me like if, if you when you get the two markers coming up that means you're intersecting the orbit in two different places and to me that's indicating that you're burning further than you need to be so I like to get it down to so there is only a single pair of markers of the inter at indicating the intersection and then I tweak the the, the amount of prograde burn I'm doing and I tweak the timing of it to get those things as close as they can be and here I am getting my encounter down to 0.8 kilometers. And for this purpose, this would be fine. I could leave it at that and just go with it. But I want to show you something else. Um, the reason why, just by burning prograde, I can only get it down to 0.8 kilometers is because the inclination of the two orbits are not exactly the same. They're close, but not exactly the same. And uh, when we start going into rendezvous over larger and larger distances, especially interplanetary rendezvous, um, this becomes quite a bit of a deal, these inclination differences. And I've heard sometimes people say, well, you need to get the inclinations of the two orbits to be the same before you can do the rendezvous. And that isn't true. What you need to do is get either the ascending or descending node to the same place where the encounter is occurring. That doesn't mean that the inclinations are the same. And you can affect the ascending and descending nodes locations by burning uh, normally, no, either positive normal or negative normal. And so if you spend your time tweaking both not just the prograde but also the amount of normal burn that you are doing and you get the uh, and you get the encounter and either the ascending or descending node to be at the same place, you will see that you can get that encounter distance down as low as you want it to be. And here I get it right down to zero. As I've already mentioned, getting it down to zero is not necessary and rather, and, and rather a trivial exercise for here. But this idea of using normal burns not to match inclinations but instead to push the ascending and descending node around becomes very important once we get into interplanetary rendezvous which will happen in some future episode of course. And then of course we perform our transfer burn and here we are closing in on Enfrod's location and and just like before the idea is is to kind of do these little little tiny correction burns hurting that retrograde vector towards the target the purple target vector uh, until the point that uh, we're close enough to him and then we'll fly Enfrod uh, on over. And then it's time to bring Enfrod on home. Um, so we're, we want to put the capsule down again into the ocean just to the east of the Kerbal Space Center. So we time warp over to the other side of the planet, 
preparing to make our retrograde burn and this is where I'm going to show you uh, another new thing that I got finally working uh, and that is the trajectories mod. Uh, this wasn't working a little bit earlier because I didn't have the most recent version of Near installed, but now I do, and I've worked out the differences, so I'm going to show you how this works. And this is a, a brilliant mod for uh, predicting behavior in the atmosphere, and it works with the stock physics and with uh, Ferrum Aerospace and with the Near. So what you do is you open up the little window, and you want to adjust the uh, vessel profile, the descent profile, um, we're going to be going in backwards, so that's an angle of attack of 180 degrees. So we, we push all those over, and then we start burning retrograde and bringing our periapsis down the way we normally do. But the thing to notice is once the periapsis enters into the atmosphere, the trajectory turns red, and that red part is the part that is inside the atmosphere, and it's taking aerodynamics into account. And once you get to the point where you're going to hit the ground, it puts this nice little cross down. Now, the first cross you saw, that was doing one complete orbit through the, right around the planet through the atmosphere. Um, I didn't want to do that, so um, I'm burning a little bit more uh, retrograde and kind of getting that cross to be into the ocean to the east of the Kerbal Space Center which you see there with the red dot and to me that looks pretty good it's also taken into account by the way the rotation of the planet too so this is its estimate as to where it's going to land now it isn't you know a hundred percent especially with the fact that I will be ditching this service module which is going to change the aerodynamic properties of um, of the vessel so you can't take that X or that cross indicating where you're gonna land with a hundred percent certainty so I like to err on the side of caution the most important thing I want to do is not land in the mountains that are to the west of KSC so I like to put that uh, that little cross you know healthily into the ocean um, off the Kerbal Space Center and here we are deploying our parachutes in the later parts of our descent and we do a quick check of the map view and see that uh, yeah we're pu I'm putting it down pretty much where I want it to be in the ocean just off of KSC moving on we come to the second flight of the Aristarchus now since the first flight of this uh, jet plane in the last episode you can see that a number of things have changed the most one of the most noticeable things right off the bat is that our runway is now a paved runway and not some lumpy strip of sand, so that makes our life a little bit easier. Uh, secondly, we have upgraded the sp space plane hangar, so I'm no longer limited to 30 parts, so this thing has been kitted out with uh, a number of things, including batteries and solar panels and some nice lights, and also you might be noticing at the top of the cockpit, right at the back, there is that yellow box. That yellow box contains parachutes. So if things go really badly, uh, Jeb, who is our pilot, has uh, an opportunity to perhaps parachute himself to safety. Um, we got one main mission, which is the, uh, another one of these visual inspection missions. So we're going to go up there. We're going to pick um, one of these... Uh, waypoints to go for and this is a combination as well of you know flying at particular altitudes and collecting crew reports as well as landing and doing EVAs and surface samples and after collecting a crew report above Bob's drift uh, Jeb is now coming into Kraken's Butte Alpha to collect a surface sample and yes, the inner 12-year-old in me does want to say Kraken's butt, because then you get to say wonderful things like we are now entering into Kraken's butt and lovely stuff like that. But as it turns out, going into Kraken's butte turns out to be just about as scary as it sounds. So, after an uneventful landing and a short drive, we do end up entering Kraken's butte alpha. And Jeb can get out and do the necessary science and surface sampling to start to fulfill this end of the contract. Um, as much as this thing is kitted out, I still don't have that ladder unlocked, so Jeb is going to have to collect these surface samples from the top of the aircraft.
And the next stage of this particular mission is to select Kraken's Butte Beta and to head on over there. Um, it didn't seem to be too far away, so I decided the best thing to do would be just to drive there. And it wasn't long after I started driving that I began to realize, like, wow, it's looking like that thing is up there in those hills. And this might turn out to be a more interesting journey than I originally planned. Now, I still thought driving would be the best way to go as opposed to... Uh, taking off and trying to land up into those hills, or at least the safer way to go. But this does turn out to be a bit of an eventful journey, as you'll see in a bit. And while we're driving, you might be noticing, or you may have already noticed, that I do have air brakes on this thing now as well. Uh, the air brakes are connected to the brake action group. Uh, that's the way to sort of set them up. So every time I hit the B button um, to brake, those air brakes will and when I let go of the B button, those air brakes will go back down. And so that works very effectively for helping to slow the aircraft down, not just in the air, but also when it's on the ground as well. And although the trip was a hilly one, everything was going fine up until the point where I accidentally hit the G button and raised my landing gear. Now that in itself didn't turn out to be a big deal. It just, the plane just sat on its belly. It's when I went to extend the gear that uh, something went wrong. At the time, I was pretty convinced that it was the front landing gear that just exploded, but looking at the video now, I can see that the front landing gear is intact, but glitched into the ground. What actually exploded was a piece of science equipment that I had attached to the bottom of the fuselage. Uh, and this glitched into the ground actually is going to be a sign, a portent, of what's going to be coming up next. Either way, I still think I made the right decision of not throttling this up and continuing to drive. I decided to collect what science I could at this particular location, and then to proceed with Jeb on foot to, uh, to get to Kraken's Butte Beta and collect the surface sample. He doesn't need the plane to do that, so he can fulfill that end of the contract just on its own. And yeah, his ejection from the capsule should have again been a sign to me that things weren't quite right here. But Jeb, being Jeb, he wasn't about to give up on this mission. He was going to proceed on, you know, for science, right? Because, well, the truth of the matter is, too, is if I abandoned it at this point, I would have to land some other vehicle into this into this area to collect to, to, to collect this surface sample or abandon the contract altogether, which I wasn't about to do. So this proceeding on foot was the best decision. And it became apparent very quickly that things aren't quite right here in Kraken's Butte. I mean, here we have Jeb. He's running along, but he really seems to be more swimming in the ground than uh, running on top of it. The textures here just aren't quite right, and I am sure played no small part in uh, what happened with the plane back there. And things got even more unnerving with the discovery of this floating rock. Now, a lesser man would have been questioning his sanity at this point. A lesser man would have run home crying, but no, not Jeb. This just spurred him on even more. And after a brief examination of this strange, glitchy phenomenon, Jeb moved on because there was no way now he was going to let some other pilot be su subjected to the horrors of Kraken's Butte. No, he knew that it was on him. He knew that this was his watch and that... It was his job to collect that final piece of the contract. And after a little over three kilometers of hiking, Jeb reaches his destination and is able to do that surface sample and fulfill the third part of this particular contract. You'll notice that there still is a fourth part still in white, but that is an aerial survey, and so it can easily be pulled off with the next flight of the Aristarchus. Well, let's move on. This is Orbital Research Satellite 1, and it is on a mission to, not surprisingly, do some orbital research using that scanner that you see right on the very top of the satellite. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this particular mission other than to show you how I botched the secondary part of this particular mission, which was to enter into a particular orbit for a period of time with the satellite having a DP-10 antenna. But here's the issue. Although you can see that contract requirement in green on the right, 
Uh, that DP10 antenna is on the stage that you see now floating away from you. So, uh, although it still is in green for now, which is a little bit strange, it doesn't remain in green once I leave this vessel and then come back to it. So that part of the contract did get messed up and will have to be uh, completed by another mission down the road. You may recall a few episodes ago, I was rather confused by this orbital research scanner on the MUNA-1 mission, specifically the START MCE orbital research feature that was on it. And now I figured out what it's for. It's for fulfilling particular contracts that come with the Mission Controller 2 mod. So here you start it, um, and it has to operate for just a period of time, and that fulfills a contract, and yeah, that's, that's all that was for. And now we quickly move on to MUNA 2. MUNA 2 is time warping towards a capture burn that will put it into a polar orbit about the moon. So uh, you've seen me do these transfers, you've seen me do the corrections to, to get ready for the, to, the capture burn, so I'm not going to show you all that kind of stuff. So we'll just cut to the chase. We'll burn into this capture and fulfill one of our contracts, which was to achieve this particular orbit. The second part of the contract is to do some temperature scans over some specific locations about the moon. So here we're doing some adjustments to our orbit to not only get the altitude of our periapsis down to where we need it to be in order to do these scans to fulfill the contract, but also to get the periapsis into the location that we want it to be. These burns are pretty much retrograde burns. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing in the odd bit of radialness to the burns as well, just to get the periapsis where I want it to be. The one aspect I'm not doing is burning normally. I don't want to change the plane of the orbit. Changing the plane of an orbit is a very expensive thing to do, especially when you're very, very close to the body that you're orbiting, like I am here. So I'm not going to turn or change that plane. Instead, I'm just going to let the rotation of the moon take care of um, moving the waypoints underneath where I need them to be. I'd also like to add that it's so nice not worrying about communications and setting up antennas and all that kind of stuff. I just have a satellite pointed at Kerbin and other than that, my communication relay does the rest. The only thing I got to worry about is losing connection when I drift in behind the moon. And here we are approaching our first waypoint, Bob Axe Nook. All I have to do is take a temperature scan uh, at an altitude of over 11 kilometers. I'm not sure how much over 11 kilometers I'm supposed to be, so I'm coming in pretty close. So I'm just waiting for the notification that I'm entering into the correct area to do my temperature scan. And I wait. And I wait. And then it suddenly dawns on me that, oh wait, perhaps I'm supposed to uh, have Bob Axe Nook actually selected. So I select Bob Axe Nook, and I'm just in time to get the message that I am now leaving Bob Axe Nook. So yeah, I kind of botched that a little bit, but no matter, I decided not to do any more adjustments to my orbit. Instead, I know that the moon takes a little over six days to do a rotation, so what I'm going to do is just come back here in a few days and uh, try this again. And we now move on to the final mission of this video and as you can plainly see this is Aristarchus once again and Aristarchus has been uh, supplemented again a little bit since the last time it's flown. It's now got a thermometer on it, a barometer on it, and oh thank you very much it now has a ladder so our pilot will be able to get off the plane, walk around, on the surface and uh, get back in. So the first part of this mission is to pick up that aerial survey that Jeb was forced to abandon on when uh, he ran into some uh, glitchy nonsense back there in Kraken's Boot. And this is the last time I'm going to say Kraken's Boot, no more Kraken's Boot. So we're off to uh, pick up that aerial survey. And then we're going to double back. We're going to land at the island airport, which will give us an opportunity to collect science from the thermometer and the barometer so that we can get both some science from high altitudes and low altitudes. And as you can see, our pilot is, well, our newest member of our, of our team is uh, Enfraud, who we rescued at the beginning 
of this video. And let's take some time to take a look at the interior of the MK1 cockpit. This interior is provided by the raster prop monitor uh, mod, once again. And yeah, it's got this a great uh, flight display up at the top. I have an external camera on the bottom of the fuselage so I can look at what I'm flying over. We can uh, adjust the windows again to lots of different things, like uh, here we're taking a look at our resources that we have available. Uh, it would be great if our waypoints also showed up on, on this thing, but uh, unfortunately they do not, so I do have to pop out of cockpit view now and again. And after getting that aerial survey done and also picking up a crew report over some mountains, uh, we are now coming in to the island airport. So this is our kind of primary approach. I want to lose a lot of altitude and I also want to lose a lot of speed and this is where these air brakes really come in handy. So I have them fully deployed right now. Um, I want to get my speed down well below the speed of sound before I even start thinking about uh, coming in for landing. And as we come into our final approach to the island airport, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the use of control surfaces to control a plane. I talked about this briefly in the previous video, um, how to use the aerions on the wings. You want those to be roll and the, the elevators that are on the tail to control pitch and et cetera like that. We didn't talk too much about why. A great way of visualizing the why of it is imagine your airplane hanging by a string and that string is attached right at the center of lift which if you recall is very close to the center of mass so it's going to be pretty close to being balanced there and now you want to start affecting its uh, its flight characteristics its attitude well let's say you want to affect its roll where are you going to push you can push on the plane anywhere with your finger where's the most effective way to place to push in order to get the plane to roll. Well, it should be pretty obvious that the, the best place to push would be towards the ends of the wings. So that's why the control surfaces that control roll should be on the wings. Similarly, if you want the plane to pitch up, the best place to push would be right at the very tail of it. You can push down on the tail or you can push up at the front. So that's why the control surfaces that control pitch are at the very back of the plane and at the very front of the plane. Anyway, here we are coming into our final approach. Uh, we got our speed down nice and low, so we should be able to uh, do this without any incidents. Everything is looking good. And touchdown and break, break, break. And we get ourselves to a nice stop before we get to the end of the runway. And after doing a little bit of science transferring, it was time to get on out of here. So we fire up our engines and start moving down the runway and... It is nice, interesting to note that uh, although shorter than the Tier 1 KSC runway, that runway, the island runway, is definitely a lot smoother. I'm not, I'm not sure what that's all about. But anyway, uh, we are on to uh, our second contract of this particular mission, and this contract is going to get us to do some pressure uh, surveys. We are to measure the atmospheric pressure at three different locations, two of them at specific altitudes, and one of them on the surface. And as you can see from the contract window on the right that the uh, two aerial pressure surveys went without incidents, so I don't see any reason that you need to see that. So we're coming into our last location, ZSTM, I don't know, something like that, a bunch of letters. And uh, yeah, we're going to do a pressure survey on the surface. Now, yeah, this is a great lesson in having to pay attention all the time when performing landings, and I got a little lazy here. I don't know if it was because the mission was starting to stretch on. I mean, I'm over 38 minutes now into this particular mission, or, or I was just getting cocky or whatever, but uh, yeah, after touching down, I ended up just like kind of taking my fingers away from the keyboard and just holding down that B button and figuring I could just break down to the end. Well, things don't quite work out that way. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, me losing pretty much the whole back half of the plane, the engine, the, the everything. I just hit the ground a little bit too hard. Now you can see I'm still flying. 
that's yeah, it's, it's going all right and uh, breaking and actually this came down okay now I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna take after getting down to a reasonable speed I'm gonna take the brakes off because you know um, I want to get still to this waypoint so I'm gonna try and see if I can coast to it as as much as I can but unfortunately I don't quite just get there but this mission is not sunk yet, thanks to a mod I have installed called Kerbal Attachment System. Uh, now, I haven't talked about this mod yet because I haven't unlocked any of the parts for it. But what it allows you to do is to do some construction and deconstruction on site with your Kerbinauts. They can actually start taking things and putting things together and pulling them apart. And certain small parts, including the barometer that is attached to this plane, can be detached by your Kerbinauts and then can be reattached in other places. So what I can do is I can go over here, I can grab that barometer, and I can have Enfraud take it with him. So now all he has to do is hike out to the, uh, the waypoint and take that pressure reading there. Well, the one thing I can say is my Kerbinauts are definitely getting their exercise this episode. Uh, but at least Enfraud here doesn't have to endure that nighttime glitchy madness that uh, Jeb had to endure. Everything here was going pretty much normally and as to plan. And yes, he does get to the waypoint where he can perform his pressure scan and thus complete the contract. Anyway. That's going to be it for this episode, and we will see you next time.